The Stanley Parable is, to put it simply, a video game. Putting it less simply, The Stanley Parable is a self-aware meta-adventure narrated by some dude who gets pretty annoyed if you don't follow along with his story. Easily described as a walking simulator, all the player really does is move around and occasionally interact with stuff, and that's all it really needs, anyway. Packed with wit and existential dread in droves, The Stanley Parable makes for a delightfully unique experience involving pushing the same 4-5 to five keyboard keys over and over and maybe wiggling a mouse around every now and again. And also some British guy saying some stuff about doors sometimes. Or you could be playing the re-released Ultra Deluxe version on a console, I don't know your life. I bet those Joy-Cons treat you well. The self-awareness of the Stanley Parable reaches a point where some would say it discusses itself more than enough that some 2-bit video essay or on YouTube shouldn't even bother with making a video discussing it further, but... The Stanley Parable is, allegedly, about an employee named Stanley finding himself suddenly alone in his place of work. He goes off to investigate, and as he wanders, the narrator accompanies him every step of the way or almost every step, notably stating what Stanley does before any action is actually taken by the player, essentially giving the player the ability to go against the story as it's told by the narrator. One major instance of this ability to go against the story is the iconic Two Doors room, the first room in which there are multiple paths for Stanley slash the player to take. In this room, the narrator tells Stanley to go through the left door, but both doors are open and ripe for a good hearty walkthrough, a la game facts if that's still a thing. From here, the paths branch and branch, all dependent on the choices the player makes, and the Stanley Parable earns its multiple endings tag with honors and a diploma and everything. If you've played through it yourself, or watched a playthrough of it or something similar, it's very obvious what the Stanley Parable is about. Again, it really discusses itself quite a bit. It's about choice or the lack thereof, or how a game is never over, or authorial intent, or what it means to be a video game character, or so on and so forth. Different endings tend to focus on different ideas with regards to narratives in video games, and the Stanley Parable is very blunt about its own meaning, while simultaneously being extremely inviting of further interpretation and examinations. What is particularly noteworthy about this game and how it handles and explores its own themes is its own internal inconsistencies and how these very contradictions are able to contribute to the game as a whole. When I say internal inconsistencies, I primarily mean that, depending on which ending route you're currently playing through, the rules of the universe and the role of the narrator tend to vary. Inconsistencies may not even be the best term to describe this element of the game, but I'm not a word noy guy and dictionaries are notoriously expensive, so I'll just stick with it for the rest of this video. Right off the bat, one way these internal inconsistencies contribute to the game experience as a whole is that it allows for a great deal of variety and unexpected turns. Sometimes the narrator can be a more friendly entity, sometimes the narrator can be downright sadistic, and sometimes the narrator can be just that, a narrator removed from the contents of the story itself as it plays out. These internal inconsistencies, and then, wow am I getting tired of saying that over and over, also allow for the narrator and the game itself to represent multiple different ideas while keeping a consistent atmosphere and jumping off point. For example, in the Freedom ending, which involves Stanley following the narrator's narrations to the very end, the narrator never explicitly interacts with Stanley, unless you do something stupid like go in the broom closet or something. He exists solely to communicate the story and to be a mouthpiece for the irony present in this ending. In some endings, the narrator represents a game developer, being the one who created the story and the setting for Stanley to venture through, growing frustrated when Stanley finds unfinished areas with developer textures still present, or complaining about spoilers that Stanley stumbles upon too early, while in others, the narrator is another element of the game, a component to be controlled just as much as Stanley, locked into forgetting and into endless symbiotic conflict. You could say these discrepancies aren't necessarily inconsistencies. The narrator is a component of this video game, and so this component's role varies because it's a video game and sometimes different things happen. To which I say, exactly. The narrator is a game element designed to play different roles for different situations, making him simultaneously consistent between playthroughs and notably distinct between endings in a way that emphasizes this lack of control that is shared between both Stanley and the narrator, which, in turn, highlights the exploration of choice in video games and how choices in narrative games like the Stanley Parable are all predetermined. Hopefully that wasn't too circular of a point. I fired my editor last night. There's a lot of things that never get fully explained in the Stanley Parable. 
And this is even lampshaded in the aforementioned freedom ending, where the narrator states that Stanley's purpose was never to understand, but to let go. For it was not knowledge or even power that he had been seeking, but happiness. Perhaps his goal had not been to understand, but to let go. In a way, this is also a game about perception. The game can only give back what you offered in the first place. Depending on your own mindset when you make certain offerings, up to and definitely including even the simple offer of playing it at all, what you receive in turn can be turned into a reflection of what it is you even want from the game in the first place. All the little tumbles and fumbles of consistency in this game is the game's way of giving you, as the player, different windows and perspectives into how you want to interpret the game as a whole. Even Stanley's existence and what it entails is contradictory within the game itself. Are you just straight up Stanley? Or are you simply playing as Stanley? Or are you controlling Stanley? Depending on your own perception of your gameplay experiences, or what certain endings imply more than others, one's understanding of who Stanley is and what he represents can shift and oscillate between playthroughs. Beyond a thematic purpose, these internal inconsistencies also allow for certain gags to better play out. For example, the narrator referring to Stanley as an individual experiencing the story as himself, that is, Stanley is essentially equivalent to the player, such as in the powerful ending where jumping off the forklift is considered by the narrator a choice that Stanley makes, is at odds with the times in which the narrator references a separate player entity, such as in the broom closet ending. In the case of the broom closet ending, this reference to a separate player entity allows for a good stopping point for the broom closet gag as well. And if there's one thing that makes this game great, it's when the funnies are never truly dunny. Speaking of references to a re-release I haven't actually properly talked about yet. On April 27th, 2022, the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe was released, nine years after the original HD remaster. As a re-released and remastered version of the original game with bucket loads of new content, surely it expands on the themes of the original in meaningful and insightful new ways. Well, funny that. It kinda sorta of does, and it kinda sorta of doesn't. It's still about video games in that fun, wittily self-aware way it's always been, but the new content is less focused on things like choice and artistic intent, and more about things like audience reception and the nature of video game franchises and sequels, and the inherent idea of newness with regards to stories and video games. Ultra Deluxe is able to build off of the fact that the Stanley Parable is an established and already existing game with plentiful Steam reviews and fan-favorite jokes and characters. What makes the new content of Ultra Deluxe stand out is that a significant amount of it consists of discussions and thematic explorations that could only exist and carry any sort of weight in itself as a remaster of an already existing game. Just as a quick example, indeed, the new content ending is an ending that only really works in such a game as Ultra Deluxe. If the new content ending existed in the original, it could work, and it would have to for anyone experiencing the Stanley Parable for the first time through Ultra Deluxe, but even then it's possible to have new content delayed as a new player to help give it back some of that same weight. But it's only able to truly shine as it exists in relation to itself and the fact that the original already exists. Essentially, if the Stanley Parable is a narrative video game about narrative video games, the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is a remastered video game about remastered video games. A remastered video game about narratives is still a video game about narratives, so not all the new content is solely about the nature of newness. If you wanted even more existential dread involving narrative choice in video games, Ultra Deluxe still has you covered. Ultra Deluxe has new content primarily in the form of a handful of new endings. Some of this new content exists before the new content door actually appears and is ventured through, and I'd consider those endings more of a part of the vanilla experience, and therefore an expansion on the themes of the original game. For example, the ending in which you take the secret elevator in the boss's room up and down over and over until the route progresses is less about the nature of sequels and franchises, and more of a gag ending that is more closely related to ideas and explorations of the nature of narratives and unexpectedness in the form of retreading old ground so it doubles up as a bit of sequel commentariness as well. Otherwise, however, the new endings and content that becomes available after going through the new content door loop back around to my earlier thesis about what Ultra Deluxe is about, the idea of new content itself. The skip ending, or memory zone ending, or whatever you want to call it, the game's only been out for a few days and I don't think there's any consistent naming conventions for the new content yet, involves being given the power of skipping the narrator's dialogue, or maybe more accurately, the narrator's monologuing. 
This is, among many other things, about audience reception and how the artist responds, how an artist can tear themselves apart to appease displeased audiences, and, more specifically, about how to respond to criticisms in a future installment, that is, Ultra Deluxe. The aforementioned new content ending, which you get after going through the new content door for the first time, leads you to a pointless edition that is overblown, in-universe, and is considered enough. A commentary on the nature of what gets changed and what gets added in these kinds of games, and how totally worthless it can be. The sequel ending, which is an exploration of the narrator advertising all the fantastic new features of the Stanley Parable 2, is similar in its nature as a commentary of new content and its worthwhileness in relation to the originals. Following initial completion of the sequel ending, future playthroughs will have these sequel elements, balloons, the number 2 on the title screen, and, most prominently, the bucket. By carrying around this bucket, dialogue across the entire vanilla experience is tweaked and altered, and endings are either shifted slightly or changed up dramatically. Essentially, nearly every original ending of the Stanley Parable is given a bucket slash new version, including the new vanilla endings added in Ultra Deluxe. The bucket works as both a check for either getting a new ending or an old ending, and as a physical symbol that represents the idea of new content in general. Bringing the bucket along with you on a playthrough results in many of the endings getting transformed from being about narratives to being about the bucket, which is, again, a representation of new content, so actually they're not just about the bucket, they're about that. The, uh, new content stuff. Yeah. Are you getting annoyed by how circularly I talk yet? No? Good. I'll also get into this a bit more real soon, so don't click away. Or do, I'm not the boss of you, but also please don't, I love you. Wow, it's almost like we're in the same symbiotic relationship between artist and audience that exists between Stanley and the narrator, isn't that so crazy? Uh -huh. Anyway, I could really use $20 actually, so The majority of this new content, specifically the content related to the sequel, culminates in the existence of the epilogue, unlocked only after finding all the collectibles and turning the game on and off again enough times. In the epilogue, the main idea that essentially gets communicated is that the Stanley Parable will go on forever, so long as you, the ever-vital player, keep playing it of course, as you're given the ability to come up with subtitles to subsequent Stanley Parables each time you reboot the game. Sequels get made when people play the originals, and the Stanley Parable's little number will keep going up so long as you keep playing Ultra Deluxe. This epilogue is essentially a conclusion to the meta-narrative present throughout the new content. It'll always just keep going. I would imagine there's a ton of ending analysis for the Stanley Parable out there already, so to distinguish myself ever so slightly from the pack, I'll discuss ending parallels instead. Still, it would probably be easier to get into it if I actually delve into the endings individually and in a more compartmentalized manner first. Hmm. Of course, when it comes to the Stanley Parable, the end is never the end. Or the end is never, or the end is never, the end is never. I don't actually know how far I'm supposed to take the loop, whatever. Either way, the sentiment is clear. The end just isn't. After all, each time you reach an ending, the game just resets back to the very beginning. So basically, the end isn't. Except when it is. For reference, I'll be discussing only the endings present in Ultra Deluxe. So sorry to serious ending fans, and also to Minecraft fans. Also, a game like this is rife with different angles for analysis, so let it be known that this is all just my own take, and I'd love to hear other interpretations. First off, what makes many of these endings similar to one another is that, by a certain point, the element of choice disappears completely. You can make the choices early on to defy or listen to the narrator, but you'll eventually reach a point where you have no choice but to do what the game wants you to do to reach the ending. That, or you could just stop playing or restart. This highlights the Stanley Parable's overall commentary on the nature of choice in linear narrative video games, how railroading is, by a certain point, inevitable. This lack of choice and powerlessness is highlighted in some endings more than others. The Freedom ending is the ending in which the narrator is obeyed all the way up to the end. Stanley discovers the truth of his workplace, that he was being mind-controlled, and as he shuts off the power, he finds freedom. This is a straightforward, happy ending tinged with irony. Stanley finds happiness and freedom from the mind control facility that was his place of work, but is only able to do so via the double puppeteering of both the narrator and the player controlling his actions. The ending is achieved by listening completely to what the narrator says, and simultaneously controlling Stanley the entire way. Notably, however, this is one of the very few times in which Stanley, the in-universe character, is seen moving around without player input. 
This can easily be interpreted as Stanley achieving some sort of real freedom outside of the player's influence, but these movements are ultimately still programmed in and the game restarts and Stanley is back in his office yet again. If you've got the bucket with you, the door that leads to the outside becomes stuck, and both Stanley and the bucket are trapped inside forever. This can be read as an ending about how the desire for new content means that any sort of freedom from the game itself is an impossibility, because what you want is more game, not freedom. The countdown ending occurs when the power to the mind control facility is turned on instead of off. The narrator, feeling particularly vindictive, states that the facility will be blowing up, and as you scramble to find a way to stop this, the narrator mocks Stanley for thinking that there might be any sort of escape. This is an ending that focuses on inevitability. No matter what you do, the bombs go off, Stanley dies, and the game begins again. If you come back to the countdown ending after getting it once already, the narrator even comments on the idea of constantly going back to find answers where there aren't any. Here, a parallel is drawn to the conclusion that the narrator comes to in the freedom ending. In the freedom ending, the narrator states that Stanley does not need all the answers. He doesn't need power, knowledge, or to understand. He simply needed to let go. Meanwhile, on repeats of the countdown ending, you play the part of someone who is unable to let go without seeking out some sort of answer. If you've got the bucket with you, instead of a tense and nerve-wracking countdown, you get silly little birds. This can be read as an expression of the audience's hypothetical desire for more jokes as new content rather than anything else, a sentiment that is also explored in the skip ending. Or I'm reading way too much into it and it's just a gag ending in the same vein as any other gag ending, the bucket itself was a gag too, after all. But then that means being a gag is about The museum ending occurs when Stanley goes down the corridor marked Escape before ending up in a death trap. A third entity begins narrating, discussing the nature of both Stanley and the narrator, and how they're both just as trapped as the other in the sense that their conflict is the only thing keeping the game going. The other narrator informs you that the only way to save them both is to not play the game at all, a commentary on the nature of how games only progress when a player is there to move it forward. And in a game like the Stanley Parable, this only means an unending wave of conflict between Stanley and the narrator. This other narrator also comments on how the entirety of the game is scripted, how there is no true meaningful choices when every possible one has a predetermined end. After exploring the museum, Stanley ends up dying, assuming you don't listen to the other narrator and stop playing, and the game restarts. The bucket changes this to an expression of genuine reverence for buckets on the part of the other narrator, who even begs that you kill Stanley rather than the bucket. This reads as a representation and exploration of what sacrifices should be made on the part of the original for the sake of the new. Or maybe the other narrator actually just really likes buckets, but then that means it's a representation of obsession with new content and <laughs> The escape pod ending involves ditching the narrator and backtracking to a newly opened door. Stanley finds directions to an escape pod, but this is an escape pod that doesn't work without the narrator present. So as Stanley approaches the pod, the game breaks and restarts. The fact that this escape pod doesn't work without the narrator reads as a commentary on the necessity of a storyteller of some kind. A story doesn't exist without being told, and no narrator means no one to tell the story, and so the escape pod ending can never properly be reached, because there's no way to get there with the narrator. With the bucket, however, the escape pod actually works, and the bucket is able to get the hell out of Dodge. Stanley gets left behind though. The bucket will be gone on the next playthrough, but a replacement one will be there soon enough. Notably, this is another one of the very few instances in which Stanley moves about without any player input as he gently caresses the bucket before allowing it to escape. Recall in the freedom ending, when the narrator says that Stanley was not meant to understand but was instead meant to let go? Here, in this escape pod ending, Bucket Edition, Stanley does just that yet again. He lets go of the bucket. And just like in the freedom ending, this occurs without player input. An interesting parallel between the two endings that works to emphasize the idea of what it means to let go and, therefore, escape the narrative. The broom closet ending is my favorite ending, yada yada. Okay, joke done and checked off, moving on. If you go in there with a bucket, you get stickers. I don't know how a disembodied voice slaps stickers onto buckets, but it's presumably the same way a disembodied voice does. The Mariella ending, also known as the insane ending or the dream ending, occurs when Stanley goes down the stairs instead of up when approaching his boss's office. Here, he starts losing it, becoming aware of the strangeness of the video game world he inhabits, becoming concerned with his own nature as a real person, all before dying and being examined by an NPC known only as Mariella. This can be seen as an ending about perception, and the contrast made with Mariella, who is declared a normal person that can tell the difference between fantasy and reality, 
against Stanley, who saw the video game world for what it was, is an effective emphasis on this exploration of normalcy as it can be applied to a video game experience. With a bucket, this ending turns into one where Stanley goes crazy because he doesn't have his bucket, even if you've already got the property of Stanley's sticker on it. It's another gag-like ending, a common trend with a good chunk of the bucket endings actually, building off of what the skip ending explored, perhaps. Mariella even backflips. We don't get to see it happen, though. We just see her holding a bucket. And also Stanley is dying, but this ain't about him. The heaven ending is achieved by interacting with the correct computers in the correct order throughout multiple playthroughs. On the final interaction, Stanley is taken to heaven, which is just a bunch of buttons. It's probably better than hell, at least. This is an ending that comes off as more of a gag ending than anything else, but it does serve as an exploration of what heaven would be like for a video game character that can only push buttons and sometimes open doors and unplug phones. You can bring the bucket with you depending on the RNG of the opening narration, but this doesn't really change anything. It's good confirmation that buckets can get into heaven though. The confusion ending occurs when you take the door on the right and then proceed to get the narrator lost as all hell. Essentially, this ending is about the story of the game being lost to both the narrator and Stanley and their adventures in looking for it before they happen upon a schedule for what is called the confusion ending. The narrator learns that he is simply a component of this ending with a certain role to play, which distresses him, and then the game resets. Another ending about inevitability, and more specifically about the nature of any given character inside a video game, including ones that are allegedly self-aware. A video game character, or any fictional character really, can only be so self-aware, constrained as they are by the hands of the writers, and this ending emphasizes this idea of the futility of a fictional character being able to truly grasp itself as a character. This is a sentiment that is also explored in the museum ending. This one gets pretty significantly changed if you're carrying around the bucket. Instead of the story being lost, the narrator and other characters from the original game hold an intervention for Stanley and his obsession with the bucket. He is led to a bucket destroyer, but being unable to part with the bucket, the bucket destroyer ends up blowing up to the narrator's dismay. This serves as an exploration of authorial intent with regards to new content. The narrator, despite being the one to implement the bucket in the first place, in-universe, of course, doesn't want the merits of the original to be forgotten in favor of the new, and so he creates a new character in the form of the aforementioned bucket destroyer, which fails despite the narrator's best wishes. Furthermore, he tries to justify the bucket destroyer's existence, claiming that it is an incredibly nuanced and complex character despite its sole personality trait being destroying buckets, a commentary on the nature of character depth in video games, and how much depth they can be allowed on the basis of how much their existence is allowed to simply be. It's also an exploration of nostalgia, and what should be included or taken away or should be repeated even in something like a remaster. So basically, it's about all the ways in which authorial intent can fail and fall short, and also how nostalgia and over-reliance on it can fail and fall short, and also also how bucket destroying can fail and fall short. The elevator ending is one that was added in Ultra Deluxe as a part of the vanilla experience, and it involves going up and down the secret elevator available after the boss's keypad key code secret key thing is entered. Key. As you keep doing the same thing over and over, the narrator eventually praises you and considers the technique a revolutionary new breakthrough in storytelling. Stanley is asked to explain his creative genius to the masses, and as he approaches the podium, the game resets. This is an ending about what warrants praise and narratives, and is a somewhat snarky exploration of the idea of retreading the same ground over and over, doubling up as a commentary on new content. With a bucket, this turns into the narrator painting the up and down journey as Stanley being obsessed with the number three, which, in turn, creates a rift between Stanley and the bucket. Stanley tries to hold a press conference to talk about how awesome the number three is, but nobody shows up and the relationship between Stanley and the bucket is ruined forever. This can be read as a commentary on how the sentiments of the original, which Stanley represents in this case, mean nothing in the face of the sentiments of the new, which again, the bucket represents. Stanley cared for three, the bucket didn't, and the masses agreed. The powerful ending and the cold feet ending are both rather similar in that they involve Stanley jumping from the platform in the warehouse and dying. In the powerful ending, the narrator refers to the decision to jump as a choice made out of desperation by Stanley to take control of the story for himself, but the narrator proceeding to narrate over his death indicates that the narrator still has more control over how the story gets played out, despite Stanley's futile attempts. An exploration of futility and powerlessness in narrative gaming means another checkmark on the endings that represent the inevitable counter. Similarly, the cold feet ending is an exploration of how there is no other choice but to die in this situation. When carrying around a bucket, the powerful ending turns into a situation where Stanley kills himself so as to never be apart from his bucket, 
a representation of attachment and obsession with new content, similar to the other narrator's sentiments towards the bucket in the Bucket Museum ending. The Cold Feet ending has changed very little. The narrator, instead of saying that the fall looks survivable, says that the fall is survivable if only Stanley were to land on the bucket. It doesn't work. The apartment ending occurs when, after going through the narrator abhorred door twice, you pick up a ringing phone. This leads to the narrator telling the story of the death of a man named Stanley. Button inputs turn the apartment setting Stanley finds himself in slowly back into his office as the narrator declares every aspect of the Stanley parable as Stanley experiences it to be imaginary. Once again, ideas of choice and perception are explored. In particular, this ending asks what a story means to those who live within it. If it is fictional to the player, is it also fictional to the characters in some way? What are the implications of living within a world that recognizes itself as fictional? Stanley's job was to press buttons when told, and this ending features the player being told to press buttons to progress the story. Of course, the entire game involves pushing buttons as the player, creating a parallel between Stanley and the player that persists throughout the entire game and every ending, but it is most prominently displayed here. In fact, the player pushing buttons when prompted to is also Stanley pushing these buttons when prompted, at least from the narrator's perspective. And having things like hanging out with the boys or making dinner being referred to as actions that occur based on clicking buttons when told, all the normal things one does in life are made into direct analogs to Stanley's life of doing nothing but pushing buttons when told, allowing for an additional reading of the ending involving the exploration of nature of free will and choice in our own reality. Art can only exist in reality, after all. A parallel is drawn between this ending and the freedom ending. In the apartment ending, the narrator describes all the events of the Stanley parable, fictitious though they may be, as freeing for Stanley. The endless opportunities of the video game are what make him feel free, which serves as a contrast against following directions and finding a different kind of freedom in the freedom ending. There are also similarities between this ending and the Mariella ending. Both involve the narrator forcing into attention the fictitious nature of the video game that Stanley lives in. Though the apartment ending has more of a focus on the story as a whole being fictional, while the Mariella ending focuses on gameplay-specific elements, such as Stanley being unable to see his feet when he looks down. If you've got a bucket, the bucket slowly begins to take over Stanley's life, as he brings the bucket everywhere with him, from work and back to his apartment. Even the narrator grows interested in the bucket. Also, Stanley possibly has sex with the bucket? It's unclear. Anyway, this ending alteration reads as a commentary on the idea of getting obsessed with new content, allowing it to overshadow all other elements. The not Stanley ending, also known as the real person ending or the choice ending, involves unplugging the phone after riding the lift in the warehouse. The narrator deems that an incorrect choice and realizes that Stanley is being controlled by a real person. This is one of the few times the narrator explicitly references a player rather than simply considering Stanley the player. He shows you a video about the importance of making good choices and requests that you backtrack and make the correct one. From here, the ending has a little mini branch point. You can go all the way back to the two doors and then disobey him yet again, which results in the game breaking entirely. If you obey the narrator, the boss's office is suddenly different, and the only way to progress requires a voice code, which is an impossibility within the game, causing the narrator to get mad at you. After both of these events have occurred, the player is disconnected from Stanley, and Stanley is brought back to the two doors, where he stands there, unmoving, to the dismay of the narrator. This is, most obviously, an ending about choice and the power the player, as a real person, has over the game, as well as the lack thereof. A real person may be able to make meaningful choices, but within the game, only so many choices are available, or even possible. Furthermore, the choice PSA that plays discusses the meaninglessness of any choices a real person makes in comparison to the vastness of the universe, yet another connection made between the player and Stanley. In any case, when the player's control over Stanley is removed, and Stanley himself is unable to make any choice at all, the importance of the player in relation to the story of the game is highlighted. A story does not progress without some sort of active participation on the part of the player, after all. This is a sentiment that was also explored in the museum ending, as the other narrator begs the player to stop the conflict to save both Stanley and the narrator. If you've got a bucket, unplugging the phone causes the narrator to lament his inability to get a joke across, because he assumes the phone unplugging was an action taken to avoid listening to the bucket which had, up to this point, been given a voice by the narrator. The narrator plays a video about comedic timing, resets the scene, and gets ready to be the king of comedy, but ends up falling flat when the layout changes, meaning his ability to tell the joke is completely ruined. No longer the king of comedy, the narrator becomes the prince of failure. Instead of sadly waiting for Stanley to make a choice after the player loses control of Stanley, the narrator keeps trying to tell jokes in order to get Stanley to laugh, to no avail. This can be read as an exploration of the reliance on comedy and jokes to be considered enjoyable. 
The game's ending involves jumping off onto the catwalk in the warehouse and proceeding to, once more, go against the narrator's wishes and go through the blue door despite his insistence on the red one. He ends up growing frustrated with Stanley, and Stanley gets to play a handful of altered versions of the Stanley Parable as well as other games, including Firewatch and Rocket League. After falling down one of the Rocket League goalposts, Stanley ends up in the very first version of The Office, back when the Stanley Parable was a Half-Life 2 mod. Before the screen fades to black and the narrator ruminates on whether or not Stanley is happy with his choices. Here's an ending that explores more the nature of games over anything else. Firewatch causes the narrator to react with disgust at the sheer number of choices that are implied in such a game, an interesting look at linearity versus the limits of exploration in different kinds of games through the eyes of a linearity-obsessed character, despite Firewatch not really being an open-world game, but it serves the point well enough. Basically, the narrator misses the point of what makes these different kinds of games enjoyable. The narrator also misses the point of what makes a game like Rocket League fun. It's the fact that there's multiple players at a time, not the fact that there's a whole bunch of balls. In abandoning or disregarding what makes these different kinds of games fun, this ending is able to highlight these very elements that are missing in the narrator's version of them. This ending also serves to acknowledge how the commentary of the Stanley Parable can only apply to so many kinds of games. Something like Rocket League is pretty much completely free of what the Stanley Parable works to deconstruct. The Zending, also known as the Red Door ending, involves going through the, uh, Red Door. Hence the name, I guess. When the narrator takes Stanley to a place where the former is at peace and happy, the only way to progress forward is to send Stanley flying off a high place multiple times until he dies, and therefore restarting the game. Here is an ending about the inevitability of conflict in any story worth telling. The story grinds to a halt without conflict between the narrator and Stanley. Nothing can be changed or learned in the state of happiness that the narrator finds himself in, and an ending is only reached if the player makes Stanley die against the narrator's wishes. If you're carrying around the bucket, instead of both the games and Zending ending having their own bucket versions, you're instead gated off from that area entirely because you're not allowed to bring buckets past that point, and the narrator, expressing concern for Stanley's ability to tell what a bucket actually is, takes him into a test to see if he actually knows what buckets are. By the end, the narrator begins to express confusion at what is and isn't a bucket himself, and after erasing all buckets from the game, only he and Stanley remain, the former expressing relief at not being a bucket himself. This ending best showcases how the bucket represents new content in general. Technically, the entire Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is new, having even been recreated in an entirely different engine, and so when all the buckets are erased, anything new is also erased. The narrator and Stanley are elements from the original, or at the very least, represent the original, and so they remain. The tape recorder ending, another new Ultra Deluxe vanilla one, involves going down a vent and finding a tape recorder of the narrator's voice. When you approach this tape deck and stop it, the narrator starts talking again and berates you for ever thinking that the plot twist would be that the narrator was just a recording this entire time. Very obviously a commentary on the nature of plot twists and narratives, while also featuring a very lovely little dose of dramatic irony, because, of course, the narrator is just that, a bunch of recordings. Now, this isn't necessarily a parallel to an ending, but a connection can be drawn to one of the introduction variations. On new playthroughs, you'll occasionally get different dialogue or different layouts during the pre-two-door section of the game, and one variation involves a recorded message being left on one of your co-workers' phones, warning of the dangers of listening to recorded messages. Funnily enough, listening to the recorded message that is the narrator is what nets you the freedom ending, so maybe the phone recording is the one that shouldn't be trusted. Or if you go down this vent alongside the trusty bucket, the tape recorder features the voice of a completely different character, one who wishes to monetize the bucket and its soothing properties before some otherworldly something or other shows up and the tape cuts off. If the bucket-free version of this ending is about plot twists and dramatic irony, the bucket version of this ending is about the desperation to monetize anything new as much as possible. And also the otherworldly dangers of capitalism. The art ending involves playing one of the narrator's new games for the game's ending for four hours. Hope you like the sound of a baby crying, and also heroically preventing both a baby and a puppy from certain fictional death. Unfortunately, the bucket is unable to join you on your baby-saving adventures. The coward ending involves closing a door and staying inside your office, being too scared to venture forth into the story. You can have the bucket with you, like in the heaven ending, depending on your RNG with the opening narration, but it doesn't change anything. At least the bucket will provide Stanley with company as he rots away in his office. The whiteboard ending is an ending you can only get at random. Also, it's just a whiteboard. 
It's an ending that explores the idea of randomness and arbitrary achievement in games, and also gives you the power of dogs. Or it's, you know, just a joke. The Out of Bounds ending involves climbing up on your coworkers' desks and jumping out a window to enter a sea of white. A bit plays out that can go in one of two directions, depending on whether or not you say you like the bit or not. If you say you are sick of the gag, the narrator goes out of his way to make the experience worse in a petty display, while stating that you aren't sick of the gag results in further commentary on the nature of completionism in a narrative game such as this one, that is, the desire to see all possible dialogue. Taking the bucket with you causes the story and history of the bucket to expand rapidly before resulting in Stanley killing the thing. With blood and viscera and everything. A reference is also made to the something or other that was prominent in the tape recorder bucket edition ending, and as a whole it represents out of left field plot developments that can happen in sequels, or as a result of new content, or even just out of left field plot developments in general. Another new vanilla ending is the bottom of the mind control facility ending. This one's a straightforward gag. By accessing an area that was a bug in the original, the narrator proudly proclaims this bug to have been transformed into a new content ending, which is obviously the only reason we're here. A completely unique song plays as well before the game restarts. This ending has very obvious similarities to the Out of Bounds ending, as both involve the idea of breaking the map in some way or another. With a bucket in hand, a very different scenario ends up playing out. The narrator deems this whole falling journey an incident of Stanley tripping, and tells the tale of how the bucket and Stanley got comfortable while down there. They set up a nice little home before Stanley realizes he never got to see what was going on in the mind control facility, and their nice little home falls apart to the bucket's concern. Stanley laments this lack of closure, proclaiming the hole to not be an ending, but just that, a hole. The bucket agrees, and comes to the conclusion that it is simply where they are, and that if they wait long enough, it will become an ending eventually. The game restarts. This ending has a fun parallel to the freedom ending, or, well, fun in that Stanley shows off a clear lack of ability to let go. This is obvious, but all this is, of course, from the mouth of the narrator. Your mileage may vary on how much stock you put in his words with regards to Stanley's emotions. The dramatic irony in proclaiming this ending to not be an ending is also interesting, and highlights how different perceptions of one given scenario can be interpreted differently depending on what was actually initially desired. There's also a connection made to the bucket version of the Cold Feet ending, the narrator explicitly states that Stanley only survived the fall due to landing on the bucket. The endings directly tied to the sequel content, for lack of a better descriptor, includes the new content ending, in which Stanley and the narrator go through the new content door for the first time, only to be met with a disappointing jump circle as the only new content. This was mostly discussed earlier on in the video, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, or you might skip button me. There's also the skip ending, in which, after fondly going back through positive reviews of the original game, the narrator happens upon toxic Steam reviews that critique it, causing the narrator to implement a skip button that eventually leads the narrator spiraling into despair, as the repeated use of the skip button provided causes the gaps to become longer and longer. On top of being about audience reception and artist response in relation to new content, as discussed earlier, this also serves as a representation of how repetition causes decay, a recurring motif in the game which also serves as an overall exploration of what new content can do to the original. The skip ending also has an interesting parallel to the Not Stanley ending. Both involve Stanley some way or another becoming unresponsive to the narrator, resulting in despair on the latter's part. This serves as an exploration of the relationship between artist and audience, how the artist's desire to be heard and listened to is what makes the artist and the art they create real. When Stanley skips the narrator's dialogue, the narrator, with no one to talk to, becomes unreal and detached. And in the Not Stanley ending, the narrator laments Stanley not moving at all due to the player having been removed from control of the character. There is the sequel ending, which involves the narrator showing off all the cool new features for a sequel to the Stanley parable. During the sequel ending route, it's also possible to get the infinite hole ending, which is less an ending and more of a mini branch point. All you need to do is love whole. This is a mini branch point that explores perception once more, as you are given the ability to alter numerous aspects of the reality Stanley exists in. This is revealed to be Stanley daydreaming, but the point still stands. Additionally, similar to the skip button becoming worse, for the narrator, as it is used repeatedly, using the infinite hole causes the hole to shrink more and more, another representation of decay caused by repetition. The sequel ending concludes with the narrator deciding that the best way to make a sequel to the Stanley Parable is to keep the core and simply integrate all of his new features. This serves as an exploration of adding new things to an already complete product and questioning the why and how. 
There is also the collectibles ending, which involves collecting all the figlies, and leads to the narrator creating a new memory zone of all the instances in which these Stanlarines were collected, representing the desire to stay in the past, as well as commentating on the nature of collectibles in video games. The narrator takes you through each individual figure and how you obtained them, and decides he wants to go back through all of them again. After going all the way back to Stanley's office, the narrator begins to recognize Stanley as a creation for him to project onto, as a vehicle for decision making so the narrator himself can avoid it. The narrator's recognition of Stanley as a vehicle for making choices is applicable as an exploration of the idea of interacting with art in general, specifically with regards to projecting your own thoughts, fears, and feelings onto the fictional characters one observes and or creates. Basically, Stanley represents a coping mechanism in the form of fictional escapism and projectance. And there is, of course, the epilogue, which involves exploring a world in which the Stanley Parable 2 was properly released to resounding failure, and ultimately leads to the Stanley Parable franchise going on forever, so long as the player continues to return. This serves as a representation of the endless cycle of creation, of how there will always be something new to make, add, or keep going, as well as a cynical commentary on the nature of sequels that add absolutely nothing. The epilogue itself also features a connection to the escape pod ending bucket version, if you've sent the bucket off into the pod, playing the epilogue will reveal where it ended up, right by the memory zone, as seen on TV and also in the skip ending and collectibles ending. Another interesting connection that can be made is the narrator's obsession with the past, a passion that is most prominent in the skip and collectibles ending, and how some of this new content is one time only per save file. The only way to re-experience some of these endings, namely those very endings that feature the narrator's obsession with what has passed, the skip and collectible endings, is to restart the game entirely. To go back and live the past, what has been changed has to be forgotten, deleted, and left behind. The Stanley Parable is a game about games, and it really gives back what you give it. Actually, that's kind of a lie. The narrator does a lot of monologuing, and so you can actually get quite a bit from it, even if it's just a bunch of noise because you're not actually paying attention. At least Kevin Brighting's voice is easy on the ears. Anyway, more importantly, and conclusively, The Stanley Parable is a game with a lot to say. Straightforward and blunt as it may be about its own commentary at times, I find that, despite everything, it provides with a lot to chew on regardless, and makes for a delightful experience full of snark, charm, existential horror, and fun. With so much to read into and analyze, I know I've barely scratched the surface of this game. I'd love to hear other thoughts and interpretations of The Stanley Parable, or about anything else that I missed. Thank you as always for watching, and I hope you take care.